Welcome, 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 everyone. It's 6.03 on Monday night, and you're listening to the 90th installment of the Age Out Angels Radio Hour on www.hamiltonradio.net channel 2. I'm your host, Greg Rapport. I'm the founder and executive director of Age Out Angels. We're a 501c3 nonprofit corporation that provides one-to-one mentors and coordination of care for vulnerable youth for the purpose of coordinating the care and services that they need to survive. We try to help young people avoid some of the horrible pitfalls that they're likely to face if they don't have a proper safety net. This program is brought to you every week at the same time, courtesy of Doc G, William Saunders, Ruben Rodriguez, and all the fine people here at Hamilton Radio who allow us to use this airtime. Ruben is on the big board tonight. Robin is with him producing. So good to see both of you here. And thank you so much at home for tuning in. We put together what I hope you will find to be an insightful and compelling view of the child welfare system. And tonight it's going to knock you out. So get ready because on the radio hour tonight, um, An issue we haven't given enough attention to previously on the show. We have Nicole Renee Kilberg, Esquire, here. She's returning. She she was with us about maybe six months ago um, to bring us updates on the state of the child welfare system. Um, And I'm actually going to turn a good portion of the show over to her tonight because she's invited some extremely knowledgeable guests to call in, and hopefully they'll be able to get through. Um, And frankly, I think we're just super lucky to have guests who can give us an inside view of the system and who are willing to to share. You're going to get a perspective tonight that may shock you, and at the very least, it's going to open your eyes. So stay with us for the full hour tonight, and I promise you'll walk away just a little richer for having done so. And stay with Hamilton Radio all night long for a combination of great music and talk. Dr. Nace is off for the summer, so you're not going to be able to hear her show called The Argument until September, but Troy Alexander is going to bring a boatload of positive energy into the studio at 8 o'clock with his show of inspiration. So keep it right here at Hamilton Radio. Now, if you would be so kind, take a moment, open a separate browser if you're listening to us on Hamilton Radio, and find us on Facebook. Go to my name, Greg Rapport, hit that share button, or email your address book, and tell everyone to go to hamiltonradio.net channel 2. Tell everyone in your world what we're talking about tonight, because what you're going to hear applies to every geographic region, including where you live. What we talk about here needs to be shared. Don't keep this private to yourself. Help us share it. Tell your friends. There's a whole generation of young people who are out there who are totally forgotten and caring people like you and me and my guests on the show tonight just can't sit still while that happens. And while you're doing that, let me remind you that we're here almost every Monday from 6 to 7 with the Age Out Angels Radio Hour, uh, but not for the next two weeks. So I'm suggesting that everyone enjoy a stress-free 4th of July, and we'll be back live on July 15th with um, a couple of actually really accomplished guests that we're going to have representatives here from two groups. One is called the Center for Nonprofits, and the other is called Advocates for Children of New Jersey, and that's on July 15th. Then on July 22nd, we'll have one of the hardest working community activists in this area that I've ever met, a gentleman named Calvin Thomas with his son Andre. Um, and along with them will be another fabulous nonprofit organization called Arm in Arm. So be sure to tune in every Monday at 6 p.m. for our unfiltered look at the child welfare system and other related social services. This is where you come to get the whole truth. And I promise what you will hear tonight, you will not hear on the nightly news. Uh, and since we're live, if you have a comment to make, I don't want you to call in tonight because we're going to keep our phones open uh, for our callers. But you can uh, write into the comments field on my Facebook page, and we'll try to answer you live on the show. So you can be a part of the show as long as you write into us on Facebook. So I just want to say hi and welcome to my guest, Nicole Kilberg. It's great to have you back. It is excellent to be back, Greg. I'm totally psyched about tonight's show. Quick Quick bio refresher. Nicole is an attorney who, who 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 worked in well worked as a litigator, but then went to New York State as an advocate for children's rights. I was an attorney for the child in uh, New York State. Okay, and experienced some interesting things that caused you to take the role of whistleblower. That is correct. And you want to pick up the story from there, or am I doing okay? Well, I just want—I I, I just want to also say that I am a former foster kid. It's one of the yes. most um, uh, the, the, one of the things I'm most proud of in my life is that I'm a, a former foster kid, and and um, everything that I try to do, I do for um, foster kids. Uh, 
And you said something to me once that I've repeated about 8,000 times. Uh, you said to me that it took me until I was 50 years old to get over the trauma. And, and not, oh, I don't think over was the word you used, but to, to be able to deal with the trauma. Exactly. That, that you faced when you were younger. And, I, I mean, and that's a, a severe lesson for people to know that it's not, it doesn't go away magically when you're 18 or 21. No, it doesn't. And um, any time is a good time to heal uh, your trauma history. And it's, and, it's, and it's hard work, but it is absolutely the best thing that you can do for yourself. Yeah. And foster kids need to have that support to um, be able to do that. And the healing is what's important because if I, it never actually goes away. You don't get over it. It's not something like that. Uh, it's always there. No, w what happens is um, you, you, you actually experience it differently. So, when, so trauma is stored in your brain right. uh, in a different way than regular memories. So you have to kind of shake that, those memories loose and have a, you have to have a different relationship with those memories. And that can take years. It can take years, but there's some really great... Um, new trauma uh, treatments out there. And, and maybe I should have a couple of these people on your show, you know, later in the summer, uh -huh. there's a ketamine trial going on right now in Maine, uh, ketamine and um, supportive talk uh, therapy that has had incredible results. So um, trauma informed therapy is, is the way that foster kids can move on with their lives. There. Excellent. And we'll, and we'll do that later on in the summer. So, but right now, let's get to the guests that you have tonight. I, I guess I should just kind of turn the show over to you. Well, thank you. Because I think you have a caller coming in, so take it away. Okay. Is Kate Woods on the, on the phone right now? Uh, yeah. Hi. I'm Kate, here. <laughs> you, are, you are on a radio show. Are you excited? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Kate. This is Greg Rapport. Welcome to the Age Out Angels Radio Hour. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Oh, Okay, Kate, um, you are an attorney in uh, Western New York, is that correct? That is. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like cross- Wow, you're cross-examining I'm, I'm going to cross-examine my guest. I think she, <laughs> she knows. You're the dep uh, Deputy Director of Operations at Legal Assistance of Western New York, is that right? Yeah, that's my fancy title. <laughs> and um, how long have you been um, in that position as deputy director, as deputy um, director, a little un a little under two years. And I've been a practicing attorney for about a decade. Okay. And did you work with um, that organization before you became deputy director? Yeah. Okay. So you, you you're basically I like to call you like a person on the front lines of family defense in child welfare. Would that be a good characterization? Yeah, that's accurate. <laughs> that's accurate, right? So. Um, Last year, there were four public hearings uh, across the state of New York um, about uh, child welfare practice in New York State, and you had the honor. I think, but I think they, I think they surprised you with the honor of being the very first person to testify at the hearings. Is that right? Yeah, I didn't know how it was going to go, so I was. I thought for sure I wouldn't be the first one, so I could watch someone to see how it, how it went. But surprise, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> that was you. And you had, you had a speech uh, prepared uh, for the panel. Is that right? Yeah. Um, we submitted written testimony, and then I largely stuck to that uh, yeah. in terms of what I said. And, and I'm actually, um, you're going to actually experience some deja vu, because I'm going to actually read your speech. And then I want to ask you a couple of questions about how it felt to to give that speech and if anything's actually changed in the months since you gave your speech. Because you are actually one of my sheroes for giving this speech. I didn't go to any of the hearings because I don't, I don't, I don't do that sort of thing, but I watched them on video and they were very um, instructive. So let me just go right to your speech, um, Kate. Family courts are often treated as a legal backwater. These cases, which often involve the most catastrophic outcomes for parents, are simply not taken seriously. At a time when jurisdictions are scrambling to ensure that there is counsel for criminal defendants at their first appearance, we have parents walking into family courts, 
unrepresented and being stripped of their custodial rights. The rights of families are no less important and no less fundamental than the rights of criminal defendants. And yet parents are afforded a fraction of the protection. The rights of parents in family court have to track with the rights of criminal defendants. I don't know of a parent who would say I would rather lose my children forever than spend a year in jail. And to act like these things aren't connected or analogous or similar doesn't make any sense to me at all. These are some of the most serious cases that are heard in the state and they are not treated with the appropriate gravity at all. Additionally, the backlash seen from county entities of the suggestion that parents should experience the full measure of due process guaranteed to them by the Constitution, I say speaks volumes to the attitudes of the agencies bringing these cases. We should be very suspicious of government agencies that balk at the idea of parents having representation at any stage of a matter. This commission would do well to advocate in cases in which families can indefinitely be separated and these should be treated with the same gravity as matters in which an individual's liberty is at stake. But there is another issue beyond legal process that has to be addressed here if we're going to have any meaningful conversations. And it's one which permeates the child welfare system in a wholly pernicious way, and that's poverty. These cases are really what it's about and what it's like to be a poor parent in New York State. Families of means do not lose their children to the foster care system. What conclusions can we draw from this? Uh, are wealthy parents never neglectful of their children? Are poor parents inherently less equipped to be adequate parents? I think we would all agree that the answer to both of those is no. So what's really going on? What's going on is that we are seeing our own discomfort with the realities of poverty being reflected back at us in these cases. We are uncomfortable with the fact that there are people in this state who are forced to live in deplorable housing conditions. We are uncomfortable with the fact that in a county with so much wealth, there are parents who cannot afford to appropriately clothe or feed their children. We are uncomfortable with the fact that the despair that comes from living in poverty can be so wholly complete that it drives people to engage in self-destructive acts because they have lost any sense of their own future. We blame the victims of this societal ill and we do not help them. And we take their children and it is monstrous. And if I sound angry, I'm just an attorney. Imagine the bottomless grief and rage of the families that are actually caught up in this. Truly meaningful change in the child welfare system, change which is desperately needed, begins with acknowledging that poor families are worth protecting. That is something that does not exist right now in terms of attitude. It begins with the very bold proclamation that living in a rundown, dirty trailer filled with clutter and being a happy, loving family are not mutually exclusive positions. And if there is intervention required, it should always be done in the service of preserving families and working with them to address the difficulties leading to such a need for intervention. And that's my challenge to this commission, to hold these things in your minds as you work through your process, to not let your discomfort with the realities of what is happening here with the fact that this is an ugly process cloud what I think needs to happen. Positive and life-changing outcomes can arise from this shift in perspective, and I am hopeful that we can get there. Kate, I just want to thank you so much for giving that speech to the commission. How did it feel to say those words to the commission? Um, it was really intense, actually. Um, I, I'm a trial attorney, so I'm pretty comfortable walking into a courtroom you know, and taking a position on a case. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty inflammatory in court, um, but that's my comfort zone. And it was, um, you know, I was walking into, it was an appellate courtroom where they had the hearing. And those are, are designed, I think, intentionally to feel really intimidating. You know, the, it's, I was facing several people. They were raised right. up um, on a little platform. It was just me standing there. And I knew that I was going to I knew that I was going to throw a bit of gas onto the fire. That was my absolute intention. Exactly. Um, you know, but I was, 
I, I walk around with so much anger about these issues. Um, and so I, I, it was really cathartic for me. Like at first I was, I was um, pretty intimidated. Um, and I think Nicole, you mentioned that that was clear. Um, but um, no one is having this conversation, you know, I mean, all right. the parent representatives um, and people who are, you know, paying attention to these things. Sure. Like we have those conversations among ourselves, but um it can be really crazy making to be involved in these cases every day and be like, you know, um, actually people's children are being taken from them for no reason. And it's a, a nightmare. And for that to never, ever be a topic of discussion. Um, and I knew that I was going to be talking to judges. Um, many of those people, probably all of them have made decisions in these cases that I would probably disagree with. Uh, and, and I was just, and I was just going to have this conversation with them, I guess. And it was, um, it was, it was it, a lot. It was fantastic. How did you be the one to, to do this? Like, you know, were, were, were you the only person with, like, the guts to stand up and say that? I don't know. I mean, a part of it is that I have uh, very little self-regard when it comes to uh, saying inflammatory things to people in positions of power. So, <laughs> oh, goodness. So you're my I mean, shiro. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, it, ha- you also did some whistleblowing. Um, and what was the issue that you uh, told the panel that day about? And don't mention a county. Um, I'm not allowed to talk about counties. Just just say what the issue was. That's good. You have to tell me these things or I'll just walk right into it. I know. <laughs> so don't mention the um, county. Well, but it, yeah. I, won't, I, will, I will not name check any county. Um, you know, specifically, what I was seeing are situations where parents would be walking into court on removal hearings, um, requesting counsel and, and just being flat out denied that. And the hearing would proceed with them without an attorney, right? They'd be pro se. They would always, always there would be a removal. You know, that's, I mean, that's the case almost all the time anyway. Um, but they were, they were fundamentally being denied, you know, a, one of the biggest rights a litigant can have, um, and it happens all the time. I I can't remember a time uh, functioning as a sign counsel where I didn't when I did when I appeared in a removal hearing. It wasn't because my client called me because I knew them from a previous case that we were currently representing them to tell that to tell me the removal hearing was happening. Um, otherwise, they would no one would tell us. They would just have them all on Friday afternoons at like three o'clock. They line them all up, five minutes a pop. And there you go, bunch of kids. Right, and and it and and c- because I didn't go, so I watched the videos, and it's so hilarious to watch the panel's reaction to what you said, as if they didn't know, right, that this was going on, but they had to react. Yeah, they know. <laughs> right, they had to react to what you said, so they immediately were we're, we're right on this. And so, tell me, um, has has that situation changed at all? No. <laughs> Oh, of course not. No. Oh, so, so parents are walking into courtrooms in upstate New York and having their children removed from them without an uh, without an attorney present, even if they ask for an attorney. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. And I guarantee you, this is happening across the state, um, in every county, pretty much. At least, it's, I can only speak for rural counties. Um, I think probably the bigger jurisdictions have figured out uh, that they can't do this. But um, yeah, hey, do no, you- this is happening to this day. Do you, do you talk with lawyers from other states? Like, do you know if this goes on? Is this kind of more of a, a like a national norm? Do you, do you ever get in those kinds of conferences where you end up talking with lawyers from other places? Yeah, there's, um, there's an annual conference put on by the American Bar Association for uh, this type of work, and it's a really great conference, and it's always um, really energizing to go because when you talk to parent advocates from across the country, you realize that everyone is dealing with the same kind of thing, which is like... On one hand, it's awful um, because this is all, you know, categorically awful. Um, but you realize that, like, this is not – this isn't isolated to New York. This isn't a New York problem. This is a, this is a problem across the country. Because, Systemic, yeah. I mean, really what this is, it's a class issue, right? This is, this is classism. Uh, and this, exactly. We're just it, this is just how it functions in family court. But it's, that's, a, that's an American problem. Right. And before we get to the next guest, I just want to say that it, it, it takes a, an entire courthouse of – of participants to support this kind of behavior. So the judges know, the court clerks know, the court officers know, the 18B panel knows, the public defender office knows, it, and, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a structural uh, 
issue. Would you would you agree with me on that? Um, yeah, I I don't know that I can say that um, all the people in the court are acting with malice, right? I I would certainly say that on the on the part of some of the people who represent the county. Um, I'll just say that. Uh, but in terms of court staff and and even maybe from the bench, I think people are completely inured to um, the absolute devastation that is being wrought here. I think they just have gotten so used to it. And because we don't see people living in poverty as humans, right, they're not afforded like the full measure of their humanity. Exactly. Um, it just becomes easier to be like, oh, well, I'm sure that that was warranted when, you know, it's actually they're not seen. an absolute tragedy. So thank you for setting up. Um, we have uh, Judge Karen Howes coming on next to talk about what the, what is at the core of this issue, which is bias. So, um, Kate, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I want to thank you for talking. I want to thank you for giving that phenomenal speech at the first um, public hearing. And I wish you all the best. And we'll talk more. Kate, come back sometime, thank okay? You, Nicole. Kate, yes, you're welcome. Yes, thanks. I'm so glad to speak with you. It's thank a pleasure. You. Have a good evening. Okay. So, so yeah, I, see, I don't think that everyone gets together and has a meeting and says, this is how we're going to get those people. Oh, yeah, it, they it do, just, actually. Well, some might. Yeah, but but not everyone. I mean, it just what happens is little by little it infiltrates and becomes the cultural norm. I would agree with cultural norm. Yeah, yes, it is. The, it is the upstate New and, York. And then norm. to change yeah. it, you have to go against the cultural norm. Yeah, and that's why right? that's why it's so important for um, like organizations like the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court judges who have addressed this issue to come into states and to talk about um, inherent bias, yeah. which um, inherent bias just r r goes into structural bias, th which feeds back into inherent bias, and you just have this sort of self-referential system. Um, and it, it, like Kate said, they don't even see the suffering. They just see, well, I say they see They the see something care. else. They see they see know? the foster care money coming into Yeah, they into see the county. something else. Yeah. It's it's not it's not the, they're not seeing the human factor. They're not seeing the human factor. Yeah. And that's one of the things that um it, you know, with restorative justice um issues and um we, we might be able to so w when you when if you can get past bias, you can get to the good stuff. Mm -hmm. The really good stuff, which is um, procedural justice, right, 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 where um, where where it's a fair process and it's a transparent process, people have the opportunity to voice their concerns through counsel. Um, there, there are impartial decisions, and then um, you know the judges can start to you know be leaders. In, in bringing procedural justice right. um, to family court, it's, it's, which, it's is, which is really necessary. Why the process exists, right? Um, um, and uh, this actually goes so, so tailor-made well with our program last week, which was, uh, you know, about bias on a different level is the campaign to end the new Jim Crow and the fact that uh, um, people who live in areas of poverty are so much more likely to be incarcerated and have their children you know, taken from and, them. And, see, yeah, yeah, see, next logical step is, you know, yeah. you're incarcerated now. You can't possibly be a good parent. Um, or, or just if you live in that neighborhood, you can't possibly be a good parent, right? Um, because well, yeah, you can, you can be. A, there, are, there are cases where people were arrested for walking while black. Um, yeah, you, you can't do anything while black. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I'll get started on implicit bias since we're waiting for Judge House. Okay, so we're call. waiting for Judge House to call, call right? Um, Very good. So implicit bias, what is it? It's the, unless she's here. Actually, no. You know what we need to do? What? I thought because we were rolling along and everything was we going so well. Take a we break? need to take a short yes, break. Yes, take a short break. Can we do that? <laughs> we can take a short break. Can we take a short This show is like so heavy. I, Kate, Kate Woods, wow, she's a wood. She's amazing. She, she's my shero yeah. for giving that speech. Absolutely. I mean, she put it right in their faces. So uh, if you guys could cue up the music, let's take a minute off here and, uh, and reset and see if we can come back with Judge Howes, okay? Yeah.
And we are back. Before we go further, I do need to thank all the people who made donations to Age Out Angels this week. We thank you so very much for your generosity. If you have an employee giving fund or matching gifts foundation associated with your place of work, we would certainly appreciate your contacting us and telling us how we can participate in that. Please private message me on Facebook or email to greg at ageoutangels.org. Uh, and I want to remind everyone that you can donate to Age Out Angels every time you make a purchase from Amazon. All you have to do is designate Age Out Angels to be your Amazon Smile designee. And a portion of your um, sales payment to Amazon will go to Age Out Angels without it costing you one penny more. I make it easy for you to designate Age Out Angels as your Amazon Smile recipient. All you have to do is contact me either via Facebook or Greg at ageoutangels.org. And I can send you a link that will take you directly to our desk. Designation. I hope you've hit your share button by now. There's a lot more show coming up. And before we do that, I just want to say uh, hi and welcome to the show to uh, Jay Watkins is out there. Melvin Ford joined us. Anna Maria is out there. Robert, Robert, I'm sorry, is it Robert Rufus? Uh, and Gregory Joseph is out there listening. Thank you so much for tuning into the show, everyone. We appreciate it. If you have a comment to make, feel free to make it right there in the comments field on Facebook, and we'll try to address it uh, right here on the show. Back with um, my guest, Nicole Kilberg. Um, and Nicole, so we're going to get sort of into the meat of what we're here to talk about tonight, which is a kind of an inherent bias that works against youth and families. Uh, who get caught up in the system, correct? That is correct. And um, I think the Im important point to take from um, Kate Wood is um, that there are people, there are attorneys that are on the front lines who feel that way, who, who are angry at the way their clients are being treated, who are angry with the, with the system and, and how the system is set up to um, bring parents in and just remove children um, actually, Kate didn't get a chance to tell the story about how um, uh, the county attorneys would actually um, line up these um, removal hearings, and they would they would call her um, like a half an hour before the hearing started, and it takes her 45 minutes to get to the courthouse, so they could <laughs> okay. so they could say that oh yeah no we we called we, we called we, we called yeah. right we did our job um, so um, what is implicit bias? Uh, implicit bias is the assumptions, stereotypes, and unintentional actions, positive or negative, we make towards others based on identity labels like race, religion, age, gender, sexual orientation, or ability. Because our implicit associations are stored in our subconscious, we may act on our biases without even realizing it. And often, and this is a really important point, because I think there's a lot of really well-meaning people in the child welfare system who just, who don't, who don't, who are acting on biases and they don't realize it. Often, our implicit biases <laughs> contradict our values, and I'm so very pleased to say that um, Judge Howes is on the line. Um, Judge, are you there? Are you there? Judge? Well, we just said, <laughs> yes, Judge. I'm so glad. Hey. You, I'm so glad you made I'll it. Oh. In. <laughs> Judge House, this is Greg Rapport. Welcome to the Age Out Angels Radio Hour. Okay, great. Nice to meet you. You as well. Uh, I'm just going to give a very short intro because we we were uh, we were a little short on time. I'm so honored to have you here, Judge. Um, as the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, Judge in Residence, the Honorable Karen Eileen Howes, retired, works extensively on curriculum development across judicial engagement and education projects, including comprehensive technical assistance to judges, justice for families, judicial engagement ne network, and elder abuse, while enabling the collaboration of family violence and domestic relations professionals on a national uh, level. Um, you have an a, you have an amazing biography, but the most amazing thing about you, Judge, is how much you work with bias with judges. Um, so thank you for coming on the show, and let's talk about um, implicit bias, Judge. 
I just gave the um, Anti-Defamation League uh, uh, definition. definition of implicit bias. What is your definition of implicit bias? Well, we have to look at bias on two frames. One is implicit and one is explicit. Explicit bias is what is very conscious. It's out there in front of the person, and they live it throughout their lives. Implicit bias is basically things that we have learned, either from our own life experiences, the groups that we're with by race, ethnicity, poverty, uh, or economic privilege, um, and that is the bias that is more complicated in terms of our system of justice, because implicit bias, people are not necessarily aware that they have it. Explicit, it's right there in your face, out front, and you can combat it, but the implicit is very, very insidious. Exactly. And what does a person have to do to figure out their implicit biases? Um, you know what? I don't think anybody really knows. No. Well, you can take the Harvard test, right? Uh, you can take the Harvard test. But <laughs> what's the, what's the not, Harvard test? Uh, what's the Harvard you know, it test, depends on whether you accept it or not when you come back having biases that you did not realize. What's the Harvard test? I, I think... For me, especially when I do trainings, the idea is, yes, I'm an African-American woman, I'm older, but I have biases about things that are not part of my experience. So anything that I do, I have to sit back and, and think before I act, even on an intellectual level, um, where might this be coming from? Okay, so we've had all sorts of social changes in this country over, the, over my lifetime. Yes. Uh, is the guy who is following me, who may be African American in a high end store like Nordstrom's, and I'm not trying to call a name because it didn't happen there, but if the security guard is following me because I'm walking from these expensive, uh, uh, displays. Is he biased? Well, maybe not, but maybe the institution he works for is biased. So it's very complicated because it's not just about us as individual persons. Right. And why is it important for judges to examine their biases in, in child welfare cases? Uh, it's important for judges to to, and I would not say examine, but be aware of. And I think that's a distinction that does have a dis difference. Um, okay. If enough. I am aware of my biases, I can actually tamp down, as a judge, any reaction my, I might have to the way a person appears in front of me. I'm going to give you an example that is not about race but or ethnicity. Okay. There are people who come to court dressed the best they can. And the best they can would not be something that you or I might wear. Right. But it may be all that they have. So the judge looking at the way this person dresses that's where the judge has to be aware that there's a bias. And that bias, though it very well may be related to race or ethnicity or gender or sexual orientation, is really related to the fact that we are different economically. Exactly. So the person may have put their best dress on, but they didn't look as though they were respecting the institution of the court. That's and that's the kind of thing that, that judges, attorneys, social workers, yes. all of us have this. It's not just judges. They're not a special class of biased people. 
that's something that just came out oh. actually in the when the movie stars who were arrested for for getting their kids into colleges they talked about how one of them was dressed inappropriately for the court yeah. and how that might work against her oh yeah i remember yeah. that um, i actually one time gave a, gave a client of mine of one of my suit jackets to to, to try to you know help them out yeah with biases um Yes. As a matter of fact, I, you uh, the you work with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. That I'm, I think I'm your biggest. I think I'm that your biggest fan of this group. <laughs> uh, I, I love everything about your group, and um, you have a bench card for bias for judges. Is that right? Well, there are bench cards cards that are called uh, Catalyst for Change. Right. That work through all that we had done over the years to assist judges at every stage of a child welfare case. And those bench cards on uh, 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 racism, bias, uh, were designed to help judges ask specific questions that might help figure out where that intersection of the law and bias might be working. Right, and actually, I was reading the research report on that because I think you had you evaluated the bench cards in 2014, and um, one of the one of the biggest feedbacks that you got was the judges wanted other stakeholders to also be able to examine their biases. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Right, and and see that's where that's where with anything that is a. Uh, how do I say this? Um, the service of justice, but the service of the most vulnerable people in our society, every single institution has to do that kind of evaluation. Because once it gets to the court, if child welfare has not looked through lenses of differences and figured out that, whoa, wait a minute, this person just got here from Somalia, for example, or is Hmong, and there are some practices that are part of their culture. Though it might be ca causing harm, you have to be able to examine that and put it into perspective. Yes. Because it might not be that this person intended to do something that was harmful, though it was harmful, but then it changes the remedies that we, um, well, as attorneys or as judges, the remedies that we either re request or that are ordered. Right. So if people are acting on their implicit biases in a structure that encourages their implicit biases, I think that that can lead to families not being seen in the child welfare um, system. Would you... Would and, you, and, you know, uh, Nicole, you're absolutely correct, but I've been involved with NCJFCJ since I wrote a book on this very subject back in 1996. Exactly. And it, it was a book that was designed for um, judges and attorneys in abuse and neglect. And what I have found are, are people who are in this work really want to get it right. We don't want, whether you're a judge, a social worker, or an attorney on any level that an attorney works, guardian at litem, attorney for the child, agency attorney, we really do not have the purpose of ripping family, families apart. But we don't often know exactly what needs to happen to make sure the family gets what they need to be whole again. And that's where this issue of bias comes in. So this is not explicit bias, that conscious stuff. It's the things that we have to sit and say, okay, hmm, I don't like these kind of people because I never met these kind of people. And I don't know how deeply in my um, system of doing my job that some of that I don't know these people, I don't like these people, um, comes into play. And I think the, the clearest thing for your audience to understand is 
and this took me a long time to get it, is the difference between people who have economic advantage and those who have nothing. If we take all the stuff about ethnicity, color, origin, immigrant status away from it, you can really start seeing that people's perception of poor people brings us to, to a different place than we would go for a person who is middle class or upper, upper middle class. So a true. A person who is educated versus one who is not. Exactly. I think that's what our last guest was trying to say to the, to the panel that she spoke to that day so many months ago that we need to come face to face with how we react to feel about judge poverty and people who live in poverty. Well, the Center for Centers for um, Centers for Disease Control, I think last year, if I'm not mistaken, said that our biggest health issues in our country right now are violence and poverty. Right. And you think about what we're dealing with in child welfare. We're not necessarily always dealing with, with violence because neglect is a bigger part of it. But neglect comes out of poverty. Yes. Or perceptions, and perception about say neglect. That lack of financial ability is not a reason for neglect, but then the things that come from that that meet the definition of a state statute on neglect, it's pretty devastating. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and those attorneys like Kate Woods who are on the front lines, they see it and they experience it um, through their clients. Well, I'm a, I'm a former foster kid and I grew up in poverty. So I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have that Im implicit bias against people who live in, in poverty, but it's tough, to, it's tough to deal with my colleagues who... Um, who who have that implicit bias um, and don't deal with it? What about implicit bias against someone who a, a mother who is drug addicted? Yes, a mother who is drug addicted, a person who is mentally ill, right, right, right. A person who may be gay, questioning, um, lesbian, what, uh, anything that is different than me. Hmm. There has to be a step back and say, okay, I see this person is different than me. In my professional work, am I putting something in this that has nothing to do with the facts of this person's life that I'm supposed to provide service to? Whether I'm a judge, a social worker, right. a, an attorney, or a counselor. You're not... And you're not we can't we can't assume that just because you have those jobs, you grappled with this. Right. Yeah, and you're, yes. you're not saying that, that you have to change the entire world. You're saying in a professional capacity, people have to take you're that You're breaking step up, back. but I, I think you said um, you're not trying to change the whole world. You, but just what you're saying is that people in their professional capacity have to take that step back and think that through. Yes, and also what I'm saying is, and this is not just us, the people in this club we're in, you know, the judges, attorneys, social workers, all the people who are serving people. This is something that is missing from the, actually missing from the fiber of our society. We're a society of differences that have not reconciled that I can respect your difference. Even if you might do something that is... Um, not necessarily something I would think should be done. You have to, you have to get to a point of, um, uh, I, I, I think for me the word is humility. You know, there but for, I could be a homeless person on the street. I could have been an addict. I could have been X. I grew up in Detroit. A whole bunch of stuff happened in Detroit yeah. oh my. when I was young. <laughs> and that's what's happening in our society. But all of us who are advantaged, we're so far removed. Even though we have had experiences, we're still far removed. 
We got an apartment. We got a house. We're not couch surfing. And right. when you're Hispanic, black, um, a former, uh, uh, of, of an aged out foster kid, an aged out foster kid, and you're again poor, that changes your life is it is very different than the life I experienced. I have I have three adopted kids. They went through a lot in foster care, though they were babies. But the stuff, this is where I said I'm committed to this. Life of trying to help around these bias issues. My kids look like they are fine, but they are not fine Mm -hmm. because they could not get over what happened to them between birth and six, seven years old. There was nothing I could do for them, okay? But we interact with parents who have volunteered as foster parents or adoptive parents to care for kids, and our system does not provide those people with what they need to know about what the history of that child has been. So you take that child, and the child is now 30, And the child is doing things that if you had known as a foster parent or a parent that I need to intersect here, intervene here, that now we've got the kid under a cardboard box. To me, that is where this issue of assumptions, bias, uh, misperceptions, that has to be put on the table every time any of us as professionals are dealing with families and children. We can't fix them. We cannot fix them, but we can respect them. We can give them voice. Yes, we can't fix them, but we can respect them. Ah, that, see, this is why I, I'm, I'm like your biggest fan. We can't fix them, but we can respect them, and we can support Absolutely. them, and, and them we voice. can work with them. Beautiful. Judge, uh, we have to go because um, Time's we up. have uh, we have another segment that we have to do. I I am so honored to have you on this show and, and to have spoken with you, and I hope that we speak a lot more in the future. Please come back sometime. Well, it's been an honor to be here. Keep Thank up you. the good work, I guess. Thank you. We're doing our best. Okay. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. So I had a whole. Um, a speech that I wanted to read, but you have to do your. Abraham, I do. You have yeah, to, you have to do your. I have Abraham to shatter Lincoln. the myth on on Abraham Lincoln. But well, you could, I don't. You, I don't want to shatter the myth on Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I want Abraham Lincoln to be one of my heroes. To be, <laughs> you you want to remember him? We're going to take a short break. We're going to take like thirty seconds off right now, and uh, and when we come back, w- w- whatever you thought about Abraham Lincoln, you're going to find <laughs> you're going to find out is wrong. And uh, then we're going to take two weeks off so I don't get shot. Don't do it, Greg. Don't do it. (laughs) We'll be back in a minute. I started having with my wife about a year and a half ago, um, where where I just referred to Lincoln as the great emancipator, essentially, and uh, and I guess it was during the the election, the the previous election, and uh, and she said no, there there had to be more to it than just you know elect me, I'll end slavery, and then he gets elected, and then they have a civil war and they end slavery. It it couldn't be that linear. Um, there had to be political implications. And of course, my wife is like usually right. And in this case, indeed, it turns out she was. But I think what I'm about to tell you, if you don't already know this, this will (laughs) kind of blow your mind because I think it blew mine. Because 
it's not opinion. Listen to this. On March 4th, 1861, Lincoln delivered his first inaugural address. Speaking from the east front of the Capitol on a windy but gloriously bright early spring day, he pointedly denied that he or the Republican Party intended to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. And he said he had neither the lawful right nor the inclination to do so. Lincoln then noted that Congress had just passed a constitutional amendment to address the matter because he considered such a provision to now be implied constitutional law. Now you understand he is taking the opposite side of this discussion. He had no objection to it being made explicit in the form of a constitutional amendment. Now, <laughs> paradoxically, um, you know, the, the man who's known as the great emancipator actually accepted a constitutional amendment to safeguard the institution of slavery. Had it been ratified, it would have become the 13th Amendment. Now, Lincoln's inaugural address walked a fine line. Seven deep South states from South Carolina to, to Texas had abruptly renounced the Union in response to Lincoln's election just his election, and started building an independent country, the Confederate States of America. Um, and he pronounced, Lincoln pronounced their actions to be invalid. Regarding the Union as perpetual and unbroken, he interpreted his oath to mean he was president of all 34 states. But his address also promised to seek a peaceful solution of the national troubles. He was looking to avoid war. This is purely political. What he was doing was trying to avoid having a war. Lincoln knew that eight states in the Upper South, home to two-thirds of white Southerners, had resisted the secession epidemic and remained in the Union. And his quote is, we are not enemies but friends. His memorable uh, peroration concluded, we must not be enemies. Now, Stephen Douglas, who was Lincoln's longtime Illinois rival, eagerly sought to keep the peace as well. At the inaugural ceremonies, the relentless, they called him the little giant, Stephen Douglas, tried to make his association with the new president as conspicuous as possible. Tell me if this doesn't remind you of Chris Christie and Donald Trump. Okay, historian Roy Franklin Nichols recounted that Douglas crowded hard upon Lincoln's heels, stood close as he spoke, and seconded conciliatory parts of his message, like, like Douglas would stand him behind, and when Lincoln made a point, Douglas would go, good, or that's so, or this one kills me, no coercion, which totally reminds me of no collusion. The Illinois senator theatrics were designed to move Lincoln away from military confrontation. This is all theater. This is politics and theater. Um, Douglas was convinced that the Union could not be preserved uh, uh, by war, or his quote is, or cemented by blood. Uh, Lincoln's newly appointed Secretary of State, William Henry Seward, also dreaded war. He was a New Yorker. He had long been the political anti-slavery movement's most eloquent spokesman. He also had been the odds-on favor to gain the Republican presidential nomination in 1860 until Lincoln unexpectedly seized the great prize. Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama. When the union suddenly started to unravel after the November election, Seward tried to allay the panic. He drafted the actual language of this. Is, this is a true dyed-in-the-wool abolitionist who drafted the language to the constitutional amendment. Then Douglas stayed up the entire night before the inauguration to bring it to a vote in the Senate. This is scary shit. The unlikely duo of Douglas and, Stu and Seward. How much time do I have? I'm, I'm really, really uh, I'm yeah. totally enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> I had about two minutes. The unlikely duo of Douglas and Seward. One a Democrat and the other a Republican hoped to counter Southern hysteria and to contain the ultimately reverse the secession movement. Uh, that necessarily would take time, certainly many months, more likely years. But the seven-state confederacy's assertion of sovereignty threatened to trigger a violent encounter far sooner. Here's how. A small contingent of U.S. soldiers under the command of Major Robert Anderson huddled behind the walls of Fort Sumter, located on an artificial island offshore from Charleston, South Carolina. 
Confederate artillery, artillery installed at other points in the harbor menace, menaced Fort Sumter. The Sumter dilemma immediately landed in Lincoln's lap. Anderson reported a dwindling food supply, and the general-in-chief of the U.S. Army Winfield Scott calculated that 25,000 troops and a naval fleet would be needed to secure the fort. Are you feeling Iran right now? You know, in this discussion, you could, I mean, you could just feel the buildup towards war that doesn't necessarily have to happen because they're not arguing over slavery here. They're just arguing. They're just mad. They're just looking kind for of like child welfare. They're just, <laughs> they're just looking. <laughs> we're just arguing. We're just looking for a reason. And not you know? really doing justice. Scott recommended abandoning the outpost because no such force could be gathered on short notice. But Lincoln's inaugural had promised to hold, occupy, and possess all government property. So instead of just walking away from the confrontation, now he's trapped into a promise that he made in his inaugural address. All government property in Sumter had become a powerful symbol of Northern commitment to the Union. The last thing the new president wanted was to begin his term by giving up Sumter. But he also wanted to keep the peace. Sumter had the potential to start a war, and if shooting started there, Confederates would likely crush the small Union contingent. I'll finish this story in two weeks <laughs> when we come back. It doesn't but end well. I think there's a whole gigantic civil war that it's, happens. It's just mind-boggling how what we're talking about here has absolutely nothing to do with, <laughs> with the abolition of slavery. Mm -hmm. It's just it's politics and warmongering and people going insane. And on that happy note, ladies and gentlemen, um, there we have it, another hour talking more about the youth who should matter more in our political and economic discourse yes. than they do. And we thank you for tuning in and maybe helping us spread the word. Again, we offer humble thanks to Hamilton Radio. To my most excellent guest, Nicole Kilberg, who I hope you will come back again and again and again and again. Move. Move to New Jersey. Move Yeah, here. I think New Jersey okay. is a better Move place. here. We can have fun every Monday night. Every to Monday. To Kate Wood, wonderful, and to Judge Karen Howes. Uh, I hope you will, we'll hear more from both of you again in the future as well. Um, let's make a date to meet right back here live on July 15th with representatives from the Center for Nonprofits and Advocates for the Children of New Jersey. Please put that on, on your calendars right now so you won't forget. Sounds Thanks good. to our engineer, Ruben. Uh, music provided by Angel Fire. Our webmaster is Carmen Garcia Valera. Our social media specialist is Bailey Braverman. Until July 15th, let's make this the best three weeks ever. Good night, Nicole. Good night, Greg. <laughs> Good night, everyone.